Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Well, eight years into BC's public health emergency over toxic drug deaths, and the solution still seems out of reach, with lives still being lost, more families and friends grieving, and advocates and politicians and the public still debating. We're asking, what does this somber anniversary mean to you? What frustrates you the most as the crisis continues? In about half an hour, the TED Talks conference begins today in Vancouver. Is there a TED Talk that has made a big impact on you? I'm Michelle Elliott. Welcome to BC Today. Thank you for joining us on CBC Radio 1, CBC Television, and live streaming on the CBC News app, cbc.ca slash bc, and on the CBC Vancouver YouTube page. And you can call us now on our top story. On the eighth anniversary of BC's public health emergency over toxic illicit drug deaths, what frustrates you the most as the crisis continues? What does this somber anniversary mean to you? You can call us now, 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. You can email to bctoday at cbc.ca or text us at 236 236- Three three zero two six two three. Yes, yesterday marked eight years to the day since BC declared a public health emergency on the drug crisis. More than 14,000 people have died since the emergency was declared in 2016, largely due to toxicity from the presence of fentanyl. And despite BC pursuing things like a safer supply program, a decriminalization pilot, and investment in treatment beds, the deaths continue to rise. The BC Coroner Service released preliminary numbers showing more than 2,500 people died last year. Right now, we are asking you again on the open line, what does this somber anniversary mean to you? And what frustrates you as the crisis continues? Our numbers again, 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. David is calling us now from Kelowna. Hi, David. Welcome. Hi there. Now, what, what do you find frustrating in all of this? Well, this is a monumental problem, clearly. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, the problem that I have and the greatest frustration is that it doesn't seem to be that the powers that be political and advocates for whatever uh, are, are looking at results-based initiatives. It's basically all let's do this and then there's a whole initiative behind that uh whether it's safe injection or whatever it happens to be and there's no there's no data to support whether it works or not and Mm -hmm. so you know uh all that i'm I'm not suggesting any of these initiatives are wrong all i'm suggesting is that if if the situation continues to get worse then it doesn't seem to me very logical to say well we're doing the right things Basically, I think you need to be looking at, okay, how do we know that the things we're doing are right? Where, how do we, where's the, where's the empirical evidence? Uh, all I hear is anecdotal stuff, and it, I find it frustrating because it's, there are lives being lost, lots of them, uh, and I think there's a whole industry behind maintaining the status quo. Hmm. And you're watching this in Kelowna. Um, you know, w- w- how would you describe the situation there from, you know, from what you see in your daily life? Well, uh, I mean, I think, I think you have to kind of link this to homelessness because mm. homelessness is a little more obvious. Uh, I hear statistics on the numbers of deaths in this area, and they're alarming. Uh, what I see, though, is a, a tremendous increase in the number of people who are homeless, and I have to believe that a significant number of those people uh, are homeless because their lives are tied up in, in toxic drugs. Um, although that, of course, too, is just uh, anecdotal. That's what I observe. Yeah. David, really good to hear from you. Thanks for uh, your sharing your perspective. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's David in Kelowna. And yes, he talked about, you know, th- th- there seems to be these uh, initiatives. What do we know? about how they are actually doing, what are the results. And amid uh, the grief and the lives lost, there is that 
endless political debate, it seems. And on CBC's The Early Edition today, former NDP cabinet minister Mo Sahoda spoke as well, um, along with other members of the political panel on the program. And Sahoda says the provincial government has the public support for the policies it's taking to address the opioid crisis. But also, you'll hear from the BC Conservatives Party president, Aisha Este, who says the province needs to take a harder approach to drug users. Drugs should be illegal. There should be consequences for your actions and some personal responsibility. And if you're addicted to drugs, you should receive specialized individual care that's suited to what you need. But we should definitely be stigmatizing hard use, the hard drug use of uh, hard drugs. It worked for smoking. Uh, you know, we stigmatize that. And, you know, we need to consider other taxpayers and, you know, the consequences they're suffering and their businesses as well. This is a human issue. And, and, and it's true that both the public health uh, officer of British Columbia, the lead physician in this province, the coroner of this province have recommended that we move in the direction that this government is, is, is moving. In other words, recognizing that the criminal justice system is not designed to deal with a mental health and addictions issue. And as a result of that, we've now moved to a system where the health care um, service providers are the first responders to these kinds of issues. It's good public policy. That's former NDP cabinet minister Mo Sahoda. And before him, you heard the B.C. Conservatives Party President Aisha Este. That was this morning on the early edition. And a lot of discussion on the ongoing toxic drug crisis in B.C. as the province marks the grim anniversary of eight years since opioid drug deaths were declared a public health emergency. More than 14,000 people have died since. And we're asking you, uh, what frustrates you the most as the crisis continues and what does this grim anniversary mean to you our numbers are 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733 you can hit pound 690 on your cell phone bonnie is calling us from victoria hi bonnie what, what are your thoughts today good afternoon thank you for taking my call uh this is a, a tender moment for me my daughter died of a cocaine fentanyl overdose. Her anniversary of her death is tomorrow. Mm. I, I'm just triggered by this topic altogether. Um, she died at the age of 17. She was cremated on her 18th birthday. What frustrates me the most is I'm, I want to go for a nice lunch. Downtown Victoria and on Douglas Street, I have to step around or step over. And the sites that I see are inappropriate. Uh, people cannot stand up who are using whatever drugs they are. Uh, we see an increase in violence, in, including stabbings and murder and what I would like to see is a specialized hospital for drug and addiction, mental health, drug and addiction. And when we walk along Douglas Street, I wish that there was an open door for a 90-day scoop, that we just scoop these people up, take them to the hospital that is specialized for them, Somebody is drunk and disorderly. What do we do? Just let them be drunk and disorderly? No. They're taken in because they're drunk and disorderly. Well, it's the same, and I believe that we need to uh, specialize a hospital for people that are inappropriate and a danger to themselves and to others. Bonnie. I have two grandchildren. Mm -hmm. How do I walk them downtown? Mm. And I'm so sorry for your loss, and I appreciate that this is a really um, emotional day for you and that uh, tomorrow is uh, a very, very sad anniversary for you. Well, it's been a tough month altogether. She died uh, Easter Sunday mm. in 2017. Uh, it all started at age 14 for her, and she died 
in a hotel room on Douglas Street, in a one-room hotel with the others that were involved, and they thought she was sleeping. But I just wish that we could do a 90-day scoop. If there's an issue with a person, if they've overdosed, they are admitted for 90 days. How do you think that would have helped your daughter? Well, um, tragically, the Ministry of Children and Families did not include her family. She has the right to um, say, well, no, I don't want to go to counseling with my family. Mm -hmm. She was in uh, six months. She was in uh, a rehab on the mainland called Daughters and Sisters. Mm -hmm. I'm a single parent, and my eldest daughter and myself could not be included in her healing. And when she got out on April 27th, on her 16th birthday, she started using that day. So what did the six months do? Mm. We were, the door was closed for us. And I understand that it's inherited disease and the family involvement is crucial, particularly when we're dealing with a uh, young child that has been traumatized by sex, sexual exploitation and detached from her family. Oh. So the Ministry of Children and Families and the justice system did not help our family. And when you say Ministry of Children and Families, what happened? They, what what would they, you have wanted, um, what would you have asked or, or, or called for from the ministry? What I would have called for is for them to include us in her healing process. Mm -hmm. She was on a six-month uh, adventure because she, she wanted to go on an adventure. She was on the mainland in, in what was called Daughters and Sisters. And who's excluded? Her mother. Yeah. And her sister. It certainly I thought that was going to be the light to the end of the tunnel. Right. You know, but it never was. Yeah. And she started using the, on her 16th birthday, she died of a drug overdose on Easter Sunday in 2017. And with the, the perpetrator that sexually abused her, at just age 14. And she had to deal with that trauma. Bonnie? Well, extended trauma. Yeah. Uh, she had a common law. She was living with a, a mm. gentleman in Langford, and she fled from him. Wow. It sounds like... Couch surfing from, in, from February, yeah. and in April, she dies of a drug overdose. It sounds like she had she had so many struggles, uh, obviously including um, the, uh, the substance use um, that led to her death. And you know, I'm hearing from families who say, you know, similar to what you you've been saying, we've heard uh, from families who appeared at the legislature last week. You know, talking about what role, uh, calling for increased role for families. Um, Bonnie, thank you so much, and uh, you, you know, I, I'm incredibly sorry for your loss. Uh, thank you so much for calling in. That's Bonnie joining us from Victoria. And I just want to give out the bereavement helpline, which is toll free at 1-877-779-2223. We are asking you here on BC Today what this somber anniversary of eight years since the opioid death crisis was declared a public health emergency in BC. What does this anniversary mean to you? And what frustrates you the most as the crisis continues? Our number again is 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. Daryl is our next caller now in Quinell. Hi, Daryl. Welcome to the show. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm okay. Um, how are you? Um, I'm okay. It's just bringing back a lot of bad memories. Um, I'm sorry. 
I'm, it's okay. I'll be fine. Um, it's just very emotional. Uh, my brother Daniel died last year on, oh, God, I, I had it here. I had the calendar right in front of me. Sure. My brother Daniel died last year on, oh, here we go, July 7th. Um, it's a long story, but there was a lot. I hadn't talked to him for nine months before that because he'd burnt down the trailer he was living in that I had owned. Uh, he burnt it down four days, or yeah, four days before I was going to evict him from it because it, he'd, he'd basically destroyed it and turned it into a trash heap and a garbage dump. Mm. Um, I told the RCMP and the fire department that he did it on purpose because I was kicking him out because I t- found out a few months before that my older brother was actually a crackhead. He died at the age of 63. He got burnt up pretty bad, and I disowned him when he phoned me from the hospital that night. Because I'd always hoped he'd get the help he needed. But then I heard, you know, he got out of the hospital. He was, you know, with the ministry. He ended up in supportive housing here in Quinal, a place called Bridges Supportive Housing. A uh, really nice atmosphere and everything, wide, clean. You know, there's 24-7 staff and everything there. They cook for him and everything, and they got a room, which is great. And I was hoping, you know, okay, so he's getting the service, you know, he's getting the help that he needs for the problem that he's got because I still can't, you know, I still have a hard time believing that my brother turned into a crackhead. <sighs> Anyway, when he died on the 7th of July, it was on the, me and my sister went to Clayton's on July 12th to do the funeral home, to do the final preparations for him. And that's when we found out what the cause, the, that they had wrote down the cause of death was COPD and alcoholism. And I looked at the funeral home person that we were talking to, and I says, yeah, well, that's half the country. What killed him? And I says, what did his blood test say? Well, that's when I found out that they did not take a blood test for my brother. Hmm. I, I ended up phoning the coroner directly and, and the ministry and all that, and it took me 10 days before they would take a blood test. It was taken, the blood test was taken from them on July 18th of last year. So it took, you know, 10, 11 days before I could get them to do a blood test. Because half the country has COPD and alcoholism. Right. I mean, let's face the fact. What did you find out? Um, they took the blood test July 12th, and on September 22nd, I finally heard from the coroner that my brother died from meth and carfentanil overdose. And I asked her, well, is that, is that a suicidal amount, or is that just the normal amount that people are generally dying from? And she said it was just generally the amount that people were dying from. Well, I wanted, a, I asked for a copy of the death, of his death, um, the coroner's report. They had sent the information over to the ASQ unit, which does the toxicity of drugs and stuff like that. And I had some samples of the vials of drugs that I cleaned out of his room that was in my sister's possession at the time, which inadvertently she disposed of so i couldn't send them off to be tested because the the ask unit was interested in testing them okay but the thing that gets me the most out of all this to this day i have still not received a copy of the coroner's report Mm. and i refuse to phone them because a little bit each day i get a little bit more like what's you know where's the systematic failure well the systematic failure is in the system you've been waiting a long time i've been waiting a long time yeah. You know, like, where's the class action lawsuit against the government for all the loss of all, you know, what's it now? 14,000 people, 2,511 last year. Mm-hmm. And if I hadn't have fought for my brother, even though I disowned him and not talked to him nine months before that, if I hadn't have fought to find out what killed him, it would only be 2,510 that died. So what is the real number, and why do they not take the blood test? Why do they not do autopsies anymore? I mean, look, our coroner quit because I think it drove her freaking crazy. She, she, she did raise concerns about lack of... I, mean, um... I, listen, I listen to you guys' radio station all the time because I don't have satellite TV or anything. I don't have a cell phone. I don't have a computer. Mm. I'm pretty much the hermit up on the hill, and I stay with inside my fencing. Okay. Because it's a lot safer that way, and I can't afford nothing because I'm on a disability. 
and the government won't help me. Yeah. And Daryl, you, know, you had I, to you had to navigate this. You know, it seems like you were turned away. Uh, it took you, you know, days and days to be able to get them to do these follow up tests. And so you're saying there's, you know, systematically there's there's these challenges you had to go to go through. And what else would other families be going through? Um, I'm so sorry for for your loss of your brother, um, Daryl, uh, on July 7th last year. And, um, you know, you're raising issues around what systematically might might be needed, and, and you're saying even afterwards with the coroner service, um, what uh, might be able to be improved there. Uh, Daryl, thank you very much, and I, I w once again just want to give out the bereavement uh, helpline, which is one eight seven 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 nine two 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 three. We are asking you here on the program this afternoon, as uh, yesterday marked eight years since the public health emergency was declared over toxic drug deaths, what this somber anniversary means to you and what frustrates you the most as the crisis continues. Our number is 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. It's just about 1227 now, 127 in the Mountain Time Zone. You're with BC Today. Well, Curtis Tablotny died of an overdose in 2022. His family organized a car rally in Richmond yesterday to bring awareness to substance use. And the CBC's Michelle Gomez spoke to Curtis's brother, Trevor, and his mother, Debbie. Drug users um, don't always look like the vision people have of them. Uh, my son was a businessman. He had a job. Um, he struggled with mental illness and, and addiction. My brother died playing PlayStation in his bedroom. Uh, he, he went to work that day, he went home, he did drugs, and he, and he died. Curtis's family organized the car rally to bring awareness to the stigma that drug users face and to advocate for more government support, including mental health resources and safe supply. We didn't know where most of the services were. I would sit on the internet and research and research and I could not find ways to help him. And when I did, he was turned down. In the last eight years, more than 14,000 British Columbians have lost their lives to illicit toxic drugs. And the deaths escalated in 2023, with an average of almost seven deaths per day, up from 6.2 per day in 2022. It's the leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 59. The reason we're here is because people are hiding in their bedrooms and you don't know how many people are actually using and who's gonna die tomorrow. You know, it, it's seven people in BC, it's seven. The Tablotny family rode in Curtis's old car, which they have since refurbished. My son always says, my oldest son, he loves driving it because that's his voice. The car motor is his voice, and he roused the engine and said, this is my brother's voice. Be nice to each other. Michelle Gomez, CBC News, Richmond. Bernadette is our next caller now in South Slocan. Hi, Bernadette. Uh, thanks for calling, and, and what are your thoughts uh, amid the anniversary? Hi, Bernadette. Are you there? Okay. Um, I'm sorry we've lost our connection with Bernadette. Uh, let's go to James in Nelson. Hi, James. What are your thoughts on this anniversary of the opioid drug death, uh, public health emergency? Yeah. Hi there. Um, I think it's obviously... Uh, very heartbreaking and frustrating. Um, and it blows my mind that we don't treat this as like an unacceptable uh, sort of unacceptable death. And um, I'm a first year social work student. Um, I studied in Castle Gar and through my first year of studies, um, it's sort of, clear that we have a lot of great ideas um, that are person-centered and, and create a, a lot of autonomy for people to make the healthiest choices for themselves and, and, and whatnot, but we have a, a political or, or policy system that benefits from dehumanizing people and, it, and it's causing death long-term and you know, for me, I see 
each death and each politician that tries to further stigmatize um, substance users as as a choice to further marginalize people, um, and and this you know coincides with with how we we continue to choose to allow poverty to exist, how we we choose to continue to allow our economies to exploit housing, exploit workers. Um, yeah. And to me, it's all rather unacceptable. Um, and, and, you know, my desire from, you know, this kind of anniversary would be to see, like, actual change that yeah. creates hope. Um, but in, but instead, it, it seems like some politicians are, are doubling down on on rhetoric that is going to see more and more people be harmed and what do you mean uh, and which which positions would you say would do that um well earlier i heard um uh someone from what was it the bc united talk about uh, stigmatizing substance users Mm -hmm. uh, similarly to how we stigmatize smokers and and i think that just goes counter to everything we're learning as as social workers stigma is what kills people in 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 one regard um and and that is is a a a choice to allow more people to die um sort of alone um and 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 i think that that's unacceptable and you know as people who want to help um whether we're you know in the human services or or just community members we need to like reject those 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 political statements because they're incredibly harmful um, what would you say, James? I, I'm running out of time, but I do want to ask you, you know, we had a mother call in earlier who said, you know, we need to be able to, um, uh, I think she said, sweep people into treatment uh, for 90 days. Um, she lost her daughter. And, and that was something, you know, as, as a family member, she would have wanted to have some input. And that was something that she would like to see. Um, what do you make of that? You talked about autonomy, but... Um, when you have families grieving who are saying, uh, I, I would have wanted more treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, you know, grief is a really complex uh, feeling to sit with. And, and I think ultimately, from like my perspective, um, from what I can hear there is that this person wants more services in general. And if we had maybe a more equitable um, society or culture or political platforms, her daughter may have been able to find or or choose a community that kept her safe. Um, And and I don't know if that's like the best answer, but I I also don't think that forcing people into treatments that they don't want is, is helpful. Um, which okay. is which is hard to say um, when when you've lost someone or you've been disconnected from someone that you really truly care about. Mm. Um, many but many. Ultimately, we just yeah. yeah we just need more services. Um, we need we need a more equitable okay. economy that that doesn't victimize people. James, thank you very much. Thousands of uh, family and friends who have lost someone and are grieving. So you you touched on that too. Thank you very much for your call in Nelson. And Ryan wrote us an email, short and sweet. I lost my friend Jesse to drug overdose. I hope the problem comes to an end sooner than later. BC Today at cbc.ca is our email address if you'd like to send your thoughts. Thanks so much to all of our callers on uh, the topic as we discuss the eight-year anniversary of the public health emergency regarding toxic drug deaths. More coverage throughout the day here on CBC Radio and CBC Television on online as well, cbc.ca slash bc. It's 12.35 now, 1.35 in the Mountain Time Zone. And uh, coming up, we'll discuss uh, the TED Talks that are beginning in Vancouver this, uh, this week. And right now, here's a CBC News update with Robert Zimmerman. 
Good afternoon. Pro-Palestinian protesters have blocked access to Delta Port Terminal in Metro Vancouver. Terminal operator GCT Canada says the protesters' actions are causing an unsafe situation for truckers. Protesters say the demonstration is coordinated with protests around the world aimed at causing the most economic impact. The BC Real Estate Association says home buyers in the province appear to be waiting for interest rates to drop before jumping back into the market. The latest numbers show home sales in BC falling by almost 10% in March compared to the same period last year. And a former school board trustee in Chilliwack has been ordered to pay $45,000 in a defamation suit. A judge determined Barry Newfeld defamed Karen Bondar, an educator and TV presenter, calling her a strip tease artist in the lead up to the 2022 school board election. Bondar told CBC News her victory is sweet vindication. And now the forecast on the north coast. A mix of sun and cloud this afternoon with a high of 8. Highs to 7 degrees and mainly cloudy in the peace. In the central interior, including Prince George, mainly cloudy with a risk of thunderstorms and a high of 5. Highs from 16 to 19 with lots of sunshine in the Kootenays. In the southern interior, including Kelowna, a mix of sun and cloud with a high of 16. And showers this afternoon in the Fraser Valley, mainly cloudy in Metro Vancouver and Greater Victoria with highs around 11. That's your CBC News update from Vancouver. Rob, thank you very much. That's Robert Zimmerman in the CBC Vancouver Newsroom. And welcome back. This is BC Today here on CBC Radio 1. I'm Michelle Elliott. Very nice to be with you today. And you know what? Last week I mentioned uh, April 11th was my anniversary of arriving in in uh, Canada as an immigrant, my caniversary as it were. And we actually got a lot of emails from people thinking back to their own caniversaries and when they first arrived and what that day was like. Uh, we have an email here from Marilyn who writes, we arrived in Toronto on a snowy, ice cold Christmas Eve in 1970, straight and direct from Zambia, Africa. I was 11 and a half years old at the time, and I didn't believe in Father Christmas. But on the car radio home from the airport, there was a report about Canadian fighter jets having spotted an incredibly fast-moving object in the sky. It was moving faster than they could possibly keep up with. There was no way a story like that would have been broadcast where we just come from. They would never entertain the, quote, foolishness of children like that. So it must be true. Anne wrote us from Ladner. Wow, I was just thinking about this the other day. I was seven years old when I arrived from Vancouver, in Vancouver from Belfast, November 28, 1974. I remember all of the trees. They seemed to be everywhere. And the bright lights along Kingsway as our apartment was across from the Old Orchard Shopping Center. Going downtown for the first time on the bus was amazing. I've been back to Ireland quite a few times, but I'm so glad my dad decided to move to beautiful BC. That's from Anne in Ladner. I'd love to hear your own anniversary stories. We'll see how long this goes. You can email us bctoday at cbc.ca. This is BC Today on CBC Radio 1, CBC Television, and live streaming on our website, cbc.ca slash bc, or on YouTube at CBC Vancouver. You can also use the CB Ge CBC Gem live stream service or the CBC News app. And hello to our radio listeners in Vernon, where you're getting us at 106.5 FM in Golden at 101.7 FM. Thanks so much for being with us. And you can call us now on our second topic uh, this half hour on the program. You can let us know, given that today is the start of the TED Talks conference in Vancouver, is there a TED Talks that is your favorite, one that's made an impact on you? And if you were to give a TED Talk, what would it be about? You can call us 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. If you'd like to email us, bctoday at cbc.ca is our address. You can also text 236-330-2623. Well, yes, for the 10th year running, the TED Talk Conference is back once again in Vancouver. 
As usual, there are the charismatic speakers on fascinating and thought-provoking topics and an audience that's paid a lot of money to see the talks before they're posted online for the rest of us. You know, take from Brenny Brown's The Power of Vulnerability to Julian Treasure's How to Speak So That People Will Listen to Jordan Klepper's A Comedian's Take on How to Save Democracy. TED Talks are wildly popular speeches on ideas, politics, technology, or even life hacks. So we're asking you, do you have a favorite TED Talk? Or if you were to give a TED Talk, what would it be about? Have you actually given one yourself? There are the TEDx Talks locally as well. 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can also hit pound 690 on your cell phone. Well, CBC reporter Chad Pawson joins me now from the TED conference at the Vancouver Convention Center. Hi, Chad. Hey, Michelle, how are you doing? I am well. I see there's a big TED sign right behind you there and a few people milling about. Yeah. Yes, I'm basically here at the entrance to the Vancouver Convention Center where they've set up this whole space, this whole huge space is all about TED this week. Behind me is, a, is sort of this iconic TED sign that they have every year and people come in and they stop and they take a photo with it. That's sort of the start of the week for many people who come to this TED event. So I thought yeah. it'd be a good backdrop to, to begin our little chat about TED and, and yeah. to hear people calling in about how they've been inspired by TED or TED-like Absolutely. talks or the TED talks that they would want to give and share with the world. That's right. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, even though we have radio listeners as well, I'm sure they can imagine right when we say that TED sign, they know exactly and can imagine what we're talking about. How significant is it that the TED talks have been coming to Vancouver for a decade? It's quite significant. The, the first thing that's significant about it, Michelle, is that 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 Vancouver, the convention center hosts like 400 events a year, but very few come for 10 years in a row. What I've learned is most, they move around. They come here one year, then maybe not again for five years. But Ted, Ted decided to come here in 2014 and has stayed ever since. So that's very unique. That's a long period of time. Ted is not the biggest event that Vancouver hosts. There's mm. about 2,000 people who attend this event. You know, Vancouver Convention Center will host events up to 12,000 people. So it's not, it's not huge by any stretch of the imagination, but its longevity is kind of impressive. The, the, the space just fits Ted. They, they love it here. One, it's the physical beauty that's really a huge selling point for Ted. They want their attendees to come to a destination-like place. They see Vancouver as the destination. Of course, our waterfront ring framed by the mountains. There's so many things to do in town and to extend people's trips. And that, that's what I'm hearing what people do here. They've come back to Ted all the time and they extend their trips in Vancouver because it's just such a beautiful place to be. Mm. They feel like they're uh, on a, a escape and it's a great place to sit down and really think about some of the things they're hearing from these talks, which as you said, you know, they're inspiring. They're trying to solve some of the world's most intractable problems, life hacks, uh, whimsical <laughs> things, art, you name it. it it's pretty inspiring, um, yeah. you know, the things you can hear uh, here and, and the, the organizers anything, very much like having their event here. Anything stand out for you in, in the lineup this year? Uh, well, I think, I mean, today, uh, RuPaul is here. I mean, that, you hear people talking a lot about RuPaul being That's a here. big deal. RuPaul, this, that's a big deal being here. But again, this year, as of last year, which really piqued my interest, is is the conference is always trying to see where we're going as a human race into the future. And last year, they had quite a few people addressing artificial intelligence and mm. what that meant and what that meant for our lives. And this year, that is back on the agenda in a big way. Some really big names. Uh, from the AI world that are going to be speaking here, whether those are academics, whether these are people behind the companies, open AI, uh, metaphysics, these companies, people from these companies are speaking here. Ted has massive drawing power. They're able to get, uh, you know, sort of the biggest names in the world working on some of these very difficult uh, problems and they bring them here. Now, of course, you got to pay quite a bit of money to be here. Right. I think the, the going price now for an average ticket is like $12,500. Uh, but of course, uh, when it became a foundation, uh, the whole idea was to make all this material free online available and uh, eventually, and that's what's happened. So, you know, Ted has influence around the world because you can see their talks eventually. Uh, right. Uh, uh, but there's something to be said about seeing them live. Yeah. Uh, Chad, that's a pretty good assignment you got there. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, don't feel sorry for me today. No, it's a tough, I, not a tough gig. Envious now. Thanks so much. You enjoy the day, okay? Okay, have a great show. Thanks for having me on. Michelle. That's uh, Chad Pawson, CBC reporter, covering the TED Talks in Vancouver uh, back for the 10th year in a row. We're asking you, 
Is there a TED Talk that is your favorite, that has made a big impact on you? And if you were to give a TED Talk, what would it be about? You can call us 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. A Roman is calling us from Port Alberni. Hi, Roman. Hello. Hi there. Tell us your thoughts about TED Talk and if, if you were to give one, what it would be about. Well, uh, I was just sharing with your producer that the uh, there, it's hard to narrow down just one particular one that's a favorite. They all are very engaging. They're thought-provoking, and they force you to try and see the reality of our world through a different perspective than your own because we have our biases. We have our, you know, uh, we have our embedded way of seeing things, but TED Talks makes me, at least personally, see that someone else's perspective might have some benefit to me and it forces me to get a little bit uncomfortable with what what reality is and Mm. hopefully in the case of that that paradigm shift allows me to become a better person by taking on what other people naturally take on from where they are if you know what i mean what a lovely way of, of looking at it yeah yeah to grow yourself is to know yourself and what i would Go along the lines of this is a segue into what I do a TED talk for is <laughs> the three tenets of our existence. And being from the West Coast, uh, Neutronoth, uh, the, the housed nation within Neutronoth, uh, we have a well known tenet that is uh, uh, subscribed to by a lot of people that are, is known by a lot of people, Hishukish Tawak, which says everything is one, everything is connected. And um, there was a, a man, a counselor who's passed this year who taught me two deeper ones to the core that, that go right along with this and kind of force you to dig a little deeper into yourself. Hishuk Nish Tawak, we are all one people. And then finally, getting to the in, innermost core is Hishukna Tawatskwi, we are all one family. And I think if we were to really look at this from the essence of where it came from, we would allow ourselves to be taught softer, gentler, and more empathetic and compassionate ways of living not only with other people, but living with the world and living with Mother Earth and Mother Nature, so to speak. So Mm. that's my TED Talk in a nutshell. Wow. Roman, you know, I, I, you call uh, frequently, and I do feel that you you are giving a TED Talk because every time you call, because you let us see your perspective and help us to grow. And you've, well, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go, 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 go. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to wrap it up. Everything is connected. We are all one people, and we are all one family. It sounds ripe for a TED Talk, absolutely. We, we could be a wonderful family. And we might fight over who's in the bathroom the most or who eats the most snacks, (laughs) but I think those are water under the bridge. (laughs) Roman, great to hear from you. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. That's Roman in Port Alberni calling from the Ahouse at First Nation. Carmel is up next in Vancouver to talk about TED Talks. Hi, Carmel. Hey there. Uh, Tell us about a TED Talk you'd like to give. If I were to give a TED Talk, I would give a talk on choosing to become a single mother Mm. in today's day and age of career women. Okay, tell us about that. Um, Well, you know, it depends on how we were raised, but most of us weren't raised with people who chose to willingly have a baby on their own in my generation. And I, I was a career person my whole life and then was hitting my biological edge and was faced with, confronted really, with what am I going to do about this? because I had chosen not to be married and chosen to live all over the world and build businesses. And so uh, doctors were talking to me about my eggs giving out and showing me really terrifying graphs about how that window was closing. And so I had to really contemplate whether or not to choose to be a single mother. And it was a real journey and quite terrifying, much, much more terrifying than starting businesses or living in different countries. Mm. And finally, I did choose to have a baby on my own. And I wrote a book about it, you know, about becoming a mother yeah. on purpose. Yeah. And a lot of women I've, I've spoken to said, I really wish you'd speak on this because the ones who choose not to and then in their 50s and 60s think, gosh, I really wish I had tried. At least I would have made the effort instead of 
get hitting their 50s and 60s not having tried and really regretting that. Wow. And I can imagine, I, I'm not surprised, but the response that you're getting, right? Because it's an experience so many are going through. And what a, uh, what an, a, a personal experience that you have to share that does reflect uh, a lot of society now. And what a TED Talk that would be. Thank you very much, Carmel. Thank you. All the best to you and your book. Thanks. That's Carmel joining us from Vancouver. Oh, so fascinating to hear from people's experiences and what you know wisdom they would like to share and knowledge they'd like to share with an audience, a TED audience. Well, in 2019, UBC social psychologist Professor Elizabeth Dunn gave a TED Talk. It was called Helping Others Makes Us Happier, But It Matters How We Do It. It's been viewed nearly four and a half million times. Here's a short clip. Spending money helping others doesn't necessarily promote happiness. Instead, it matters how we do it. And if we want people to give more, we need to subvert the way we think about charitable giving. We need to create opportunities to give that enable us to appreciate our shared humanity. If any of you work for a charity, don't reward your donors with pens or calendars. Elizabeth Dunn is the author of Happy Money, The Science of Happier Spending, and a frequent commentator on what makes us happy. Elizabeth joins me now. Hello. Hi there. How does it feel looking back on your TED Talk? Oh, wow. It brings back a lot of memories. Um, it was certainly one of the most exciting things I've ever done. A little bit nerve wracking, but also incredibly rewarding. And I was just blown away by the supportiveness of the audience at TED. Well, that's just it. And since then, I mean, we've referred to your talk many times here, um, four and a half million views. How do you feel about the reception? I, I was really blown away. You never know what to expect. And I think one of the best parts is that I hear from people all over the world. And I've heard from people who've actually used the talk to help create positive change in the world. So that's mm. been uh, one of the most exciting parts. Um, Ted's new motto is um, instead of um, uh, ideas worth spreading, they've changed it to ideas change everything. Mm. And I hope that my idea has been part of that. Wow. For yourself, what has life been like since 2019? Uh, well, I've been pretty busy. I've been teaching at the University of British Columbia, where I'm a professor, continuing my research. And now I'm um, thinking about how we can bring some of that joy that I talked about with giving into the climate change movement. Mm. So that's my newest project. I do notice many talks touch on climate change um, more recently. Elizabeth, why do you think there's such an appetite for these, you know, these kernels of wisdom and ideas? You know, I think human beings have this fundamental desire to learn, to be challenged, to consider new ideas. And I think TED is a beautiful celebration of that. And I think, you know, the fact that so many people spend some time watching TED Talks, which by the <laughs> standards of today's, you know, 10 second TikTok videos are <laughs> yeah. long com by comparison. And so, you know, it, it actually warms my heart to think that people will sit down and watch, you know, a 12 or 14 minute talk and really come away with an idea or um, a, a concept or even a plan for their own future that mm. maybe they didn't start out with. And you're also spending some, spending some time at the convention center. Is that right? I sure am. I'm heading down there right now. It's such an exciting <laughs> time. There's so many amazing people uh, in town right now. I had dinner last night with the founder of Duolingo. Um, there's so many interesting people. So if you kind of feel like there's an extra brain buzz in Vancouver right now, you know, it's just emanating from the convention center and just so many interesting people that want to learn and want to make the world a better place um, convening in our city right now. Wow. Okay. You can tell the owner, the founder of Duolingo, I've spent many hours uh, trying to make my way to the next stage. <laughs> um, and do you think that these TED Talks, you know, these the audience that's there has has paid a lot of money to be there. Is it is it still relatable to the general public? Yeah, I mean, I think um, for one thing, TED is all about generosity. So the money that people pay, and admittedly, it's a lot of money. The money that people pay to go see TED is what actually funds the um, engine that enables TED to share these talks freely mm. with the world. 
So in essence, the folks that are down there um, at the convention center this week, they're getting to see the talks live, but then their um, conference fees are helping to make these talks available to everybody all over the world. And so it's a really beautiful model of, of generosity, I think. And we'll get to see them afterward as well online. Yes. Have a great time and, and, and enjoy the success that you've had since your TED Talk. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. That is UBC social, social psychologist Elizabeth Dunn. And you can watch her TED Talk online. It's called Helping Others Makes Us Happier, But It Matters How We Do It. Yes, almost four and a half million views on the TED webpage. Uh, and of course, a lot of TED Talks on there that you can take a look at as well. And we'll try to find out what more can be coming uh, from uh, speakers at TED Talks. Well, join us tomorrow on the show. We'll have our own special talk uh, here on the program. It's almost like TED Talks mirrors what we do here, right? Hear people's perspectives and perhaps grow ourselves and know ourselves as we heard from our caller. Well, tomorrow we'll talk about teens and resilience. Now, UBC's Green College is hosting a talk with pediatrician Dr. Jung Vo, and he's the author of The Mindful Teen, powerful skills to help you handle stress one moment at a time. And yes, while adolescence can be seen as a time of much stress, he's going to focus on the strengths and the resilience of young adults and what are the strategies for making your way and navigating through uh, those stressful times. So if you have any questions or want to share what your family has been going through and what are ways that you've been able to help your teen um, be more resilient and face life's challenges. We would love to hear from you. That's tomorrow on the show. If you want to email us now, you can do so. It's bctoday at cbc.ca. What are your own stories of teen resilience? Perhaps something you learned when you were a teen yourself What's something that uh, you are trying to impart to your teen right now as they face uh, their own challenges and during what, yes, is a very stressful time. So BC Today at cbc.ca. Love to get your emails uh, this afternoon here on the show. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Again, it's bctoday at cbc.ca.